Welcome to the ASRS Oral History of Retina series. The purpose of these interviews is to capture first-hand stories from individuals with unique retinal insights of historical significance. Through these discussions, we will fill in gaps in our understanding of the evolution of the science and practice of retina. And it's our hope that these discussions will serve as the illuminating element in the larger mosaic of the history of retina. My distinct honor to introduce today's ASRS oral history contributor, Dr. George Williams. George is currently the professor and chair of ophthalmology at Oakland University, William Beaumont School of Medicine in Royal Oak, Michigan. He's a partner of Associated Retina Consultants, arguably one of the largest and most respected retinal practice groups in the world. He co-directs the group's retinal fellowship program, which also is crowned as the best retinal fellowship in the country. He has published over 250 articles and book chapters. He's participated in over 30 major clinical trials. For 10 years, George served as ophthalmology's representative to the AMA's committee on the Relative Value Update Committee, what we call the RUC. He served there for 10 very important years, as we will learn in today's interview. We all owe an enormous amount to George's tireless accomplishments in our behalf. His career is indeed important part of the history of retina, and I'm very happy to be able to document those accomplishments as part of the oral history series of the ASRS. George, welcome. Thank you, Kirk. It's great to be with you. I know you're a Chicago guy. You were born and grew up here in Chicago. I know you're an avid Cubs fan. I got to believe there's a part in your heart that loves Chicago deep dish pizza more than the Detroit style pizza. Can you tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up here in Chicago? Well, it was great. I was a child of the 50s and 60s. As you said, I, I grew up a Cub fan. My heroes were Ernie Banks and Ron Santo and Billy Williams. One of my earliest recollections is the first time I walked into Wrigley Field. I had never seen anything so green, looking at the ivy walls in the field. And I was hooked on baseball from that time on have lived and died with the Cubs over the past 60-odd years, mostly dying with them. But we've had a couple of good times. So from Chicago, you went to a great liberal arts college, Denison University in Ohio, right outside Cleveland, Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, then you came back to Chicago for medical school at Northwestern, where you were elected AOA. From there, you went a little bit north to Milwaukee, to the Medical College of Wisconsin, for your ophthalmology residency and later on for your retinal fellowship too. What about the Milwaukee approach was different than the other, the other schools at that time? When I came as a first year, the, the retina service was Fred Reeser, Travis Meredith, who you know very well, and Trex Topping. And then a year later when Travis left to go to Emory, uh, we managed to replace him with another pretty good guy by the name of Gary Abrams. So I really feel I had the opportunity to train with some simply amazing people. One of the great strengths of the Milwaukee program at that time is everyone was willing to listen to each other, to critically evaluate new approaches and new technologies. And it was just such an exciting time to be able to be part of that. You're heading to Retina and you decided to do a year of research first. Uh, tell me why and what you did during that year. Well, a lot of that was the influence of, of Trex and Gary. Uh, they had done basic research in their careers, had done a lot of very, very fundamental work in PVR, ocular trauma, and they encouraged me to spend a year in the lab particularly because we had two amazing mentors. We had Henry Adelhauser in Milwaukee and Diane Van Horn, both two brilliant PhD investigators. And so I had the opportunity to spend time uh, with both Hank and Diane and learned a lot. 
when you spend time in the lab, you learn a different skill set. You learn how to critically evaluate problems, how to structure studies, how to structure trials, and just to look at clinical problems with a different perspective. And it was, it was a great year for me and a great opportunity to spend time with them. Tell me a little bit about the year as a clinical fellow with Tom Auberg and what kind of things were happening uh, in that year. We were one of the regional national centers for complex retinal detachment, PVR, and traction retinal detachments in diabetes. So during my fellowship, Tom and Gary were finalizing some of their concepts about anterior proliferation in PVR, uh, how to address that, vitreous based dissections. Gary was working on his concepts of on-block traction detachment. This is before we really had the technology to allow us true bimanual dissections. So Gary figured out the role of vitreous traction and allowing us to maintain tissue planes and, of course, first published the concept of, of on-block. And then we continued to, to work, look for the magic cocktail to retard PVR. Unfortunately, we never really came up with one that worked well. But we're all, we're all still working in that area. It shows you that we've come a long way and we still have a long way to go. Tell me what it's like doing uh, surgery with Gary. It was demanding. Gary was very meticulous. Uh, one of the more difficult parts of working with Gary was the loud country music that you were subjected to. Gary loved his country music. And um, I remember I was operating one time, and all of a sudden he goes, stop, stop. And I thought I had done something wrong. And he sat back in his chair and said, this is one of the best country songs of all time. I don't remember the details, but it involves something about a dog dying in a pickup truck. You gotta have your priorities straight in the operating room. Uh, how about Trex Topping? What was his influence on you as a fellow? He was also, as was Gary, and as was Tom, you know, trained by Robert Mockamer. Uh, I feel indirectly that I was trained by Robert because I had the, the privilege of being trained by three of uh, his very best. But, but Trex, again, was another one of those people who was always asking the question, why can't we do this better? There, there should be a better way to accomplish our goals. And like Gary, he was a, a surgical virtuoso. I, I remember thinking, boy, if I could just become half as good as either one of these guys, I'd be very happy. Can you tell me a little bit about your early years as a faculty member now at uh, MCW? what kind of things you were involved with and what was your, your, your plan of action? So because of my opportunity to spend time in the lab, I had a couple of ideas. Early on, I was interested in the role of prostaglandins, uh, particularly thromboxane and various other prostaglandin analogs in retinal detachment. So we did a little preliminary work in that. And one of the early problems that we had with vitrectomy was a severe fibrin response. We don't see that very often now. Part of the reason for that was we commonly did a primary lensectomy on many of these patients. And in the bad diabetics, we would often get this severe fibrin response. And in some of them, it would absolutely cause the operation to fail. So as I had the opportunity to work with a hematologist when I was in med school and also during my internship. And I recalled some information about the role of plasmin. And I spoke with uh, a fellow resident of mine, uh, Bob Snyder, who was an MD, PhD. But Bob when he was on the retina service, saw some of this fibrin problem, and he said, you know, you really ought to look into plasminogen activators. And in fact, that was what he had done his PhD in. So right around that time, TPA had just become available for thrombolytic treatment of a coronary artery disease. And so we developed an animal model 
uh, in the rabbit of fibrin, and we got some TPA and we put it in some eyes, and I remember the first experiments were absolutely stunning. You could literally just watch the fibrin melt away after you put the TPA in. I remember putting TPA in our first patient with severe fibrin, and literally a few hours later, the fibrin was gone. It was clear that in order for us to become more successful as surgeons, we needed to get away from the concept of just cold steel cutting and to start to understand the pathophysiology and the molecular biology of the diseases that we were dealing with. And I think plasminogen and its role in disease, that was one of the first steps in really retinal pharmacology. You did more than TPA as well. When did you have the, the idea of uh, enzymatic vitriolysis? So I had been thinking about the possibility of dissolving the vitreous once we started to use TPA. But the problem with TPA is you have to have the, the enzyme present. In other words, you have to have the plasminogen present in order to be activated by the enzyme. So we were thinking about, well, what if we could just create our own plasmin? And right around that time, I made my move to Detroit, and Mike Tracy and I started talking about the role of potential role of vitriolysis. Mike, of course, at that time was revolutionizing pediatric retinal surgery. But to this day, one of the problems that we have in pediatric vitreal retinal surgery is the dense adhesion of the vitreous to the retina. And this is not an anatomic adhesion, it's, it's a strictly chemical adhesion. So it became readily apparent to Mike that a technology that could weaken the vitreal retinal adhesion, such as plasmin, would be of great utility in his surgery. And so he and I started to explore that. George, you, you described your contributions here, which were uh, uh, incredible, of, of getting in, in the pharmacological way of manipulating vitreous, TPA, fibrinogen activators. But you were starting out doing that in Milwaukee at a university. And what you described teaming up with Mike Tracy was in Detroit in private practice. Why did you decide to, to leave and go into private practice? I think much of it was my friendship with Mark Blumenkrantz. And Mark preceded me coming to Detroit. He came to Detroit in, uh, I believe it would have been 1985. And so he left Bascom Palmer, uh, came to Detroit, and I met Mark at a meeting one time, and I, I asked him the question you just asked me. You know, why would you leave Bascom Palmer to come to Detroit? And he said, well, it was because of the opportunity to have a little bit more control over my life and to be able to structure my research and my teaching in a very similar manner to what I had at, at Bascom Palmer. We were fortunate in that we had uh, access to the resources, our hospital, Beaumont Hospital, was very supportive of what we did. And so we, I actually felt that it was the best of both worlds. I could pursue my research interests, I could pursue my clinical interests, and frankly, I had a little more control over my life. When fellows are looking for a job now, they call that the culture of the group you're going to join, whether it's in a university or private practice. That wasn't a typical run-of-the-mill private practice you were joining. And I think you joined at a time when there really was this transition in respect for what you could accomplish in academics from the private sector. You're absolutely right. We had a culture that allowed everyone to pursue their academic interests. And frankly, that, that came from our founder, that was Ray Margario. Ray wanted to participate in clinical trials. He didn't, he didn't have a basic science background, but Ray had an amazing ability to recognize people with talent. Ray McGarriel also 
had an interest in the business side of medicine too, as did Trex Topping. Can you tell me how that got you going on your career path with that interest? Well, when Trex left Milwaukee, Tom came to me and said, okay, you're going to be our Trexler now, and I want you to learn about insurance and coding and all the the minutia on the business side of retinal practice. So I did, and then when I came to Detroit, uh, Ray knew that I was interested in that and, and had some, uh, some abilities in it. So he basically got me involved in the management of our practice early on, even before I was a partner, I was involved in those discussions. And at the time, Ray was a member of the Health Policy Committee of the Academy, serving as one of the retinal representatives. And so he also would participate uh, with the Academy at, at the RUC. And there was a t time came up where there were some retinal codes that were being presented at the RUC, and Ray was unable to attend. And so he called up Bill Rich and said, listen, Bill, I can't make it, but I got this guy named Williams who can do it. And so that really was my introduction to the RUC. There's few people, as I said, that know this field better than Bill Rich and you. Uh, and, and what you've accomplished for us is a lot. Take us through the history of this. You mentioned the RUC. In 1966, Medicare started. And the whole concept of a federal health insurance policy was literally fought tooth and nail by organized medicine, and specifically the American Medical Association. And the idea was that this would destroy physician independence and the ability of physicians to practice. But a few years into Medicare, everyone seemed to realize that checks from the federal government don't bounce. And we realized that it was a really good deal for doctors. And it was a particularly good deal back then because payment was based on what was called CPR. It was essentially the usual and customary uh, uh, fees. And so basically we had this huge disparity where for, for the exact same procedure, some physicians would be paid much more than others. What were some of the steps and the things that first started to Medicare really start to ratchet down and change their approach and how doctors were utilizing that, that fee structure? Well, the first step started in the late 70s and 80s, actually, with the realization that hospital costs needed to come under control. So first they addressed hospital costs. They put it in what are now known as the DRGs, the Diagnosis-Related Groups, in which they told hospitals, you're only going to get paid X amount of dollars for this type of hospitalization. And that was a, a relatively straightforward process. But then all of a sudden they said, well, we need something similar to DRGs for physicians. So after nearly a decade of work, eventually that evolved into the resource-based relative value system. And there's a long history on, on how that was developed, but that actually uh, was uh, codified by a, an act called the uh, OBRA Act of 1989, which required that Medicare Institute and RVRBS system by 1992. And so that's really when we started with the current system that we have now where codes are valued uh, primarily by the RUC, but with the ascent of CMS. And the goal here is to, to provide some relativity. So in our world, what that meant was we had to come up with the ability to discuss the difference between performing a vitrectomy and not only uh, other ocular procedures such as cataract surgery, but how do you provide relativity between a vitrectomy and delivering a baby? And so that's what the RVRBS system is all about. Who started that, uh, George? It was, uh, came out of Harvard, is that not correct? So initially the AMA wanted to do it, 
But the Federal Trade Commission said that that would be a violation. And, but they would allow a nonprofit uh, organization to do it. And uh, Dr. Chow was a health policy person at the time. And so the AMA actually contracted with Harvard to, do, to work on this system. The AMA did have a lot of input, and that was sort of a backdoor around the Federal Trade Commission concerns. Chow came up with this thing that we call a relative value unit, an RVU. And it's a particular dollar amount that then you can multiply by a, a, a particular figure that you pick by inflation each year. How is an RVU actually calculated? Can you give us a little idea of what goes into the calculation of that when you sit down at the ruck to determine how much something should be valued? Absolutely. So the key word on the whole process is relative. So we have 10,000 now CPT codes. So now we have a data set of the valuation of many of those. So when a new code comes before us, what we have to do is we have to figure out where in that spectrum does this code fit. So we have codes that everyone pretty much agrees are fairly valued. And those are called MPC codes, multi-specialty points of comparison. And so we use those codes uh, to sort of set uh, different milestones. And we say, OK, everyone agrees that this code is worth X RVUs. How does this new procedure, or how does this old procedure compare to those, those yardsticks? And that, that we do that through a process of surveys. So physicians are asked to rank procedures, and not only procedures that, that they know, uh, but try to compare them to, to other procedures in medicine. We do that through what's called a reference service list. And so, again, physicians have the opportunity to participate in the process. I will say that it's tedious. It's a bit cumbersome, but we do have this opportunity, so it's incumbent upon us to take that very seriously. You witnessed the ruck in its early days and were there for 10 years. Um, how did ophthalmology fare during that time? Did we make out okay compared to other groups? Did we get uh, the short end of the stick? What would you say? We did relatively well. <laughs> and by that I mean, if you look at the components that go into the eventual values, there's basically two drivers on the physician work side. There's the time it takes the procedure, and there's the intensity. Those are the two factors for physician work. And on the intensity side, ophthalmology has historically done very well. Where we've been burned is the fact that we've gotten a lot better at what we do. We're much more efficient. And so our time to perform procedures has gone down significantly. When you and I trained, it was not at all unusual to do a two, three, four hour vitrectomy for a bad PVR. It's pretty rare for cases to go much beyond two hours now. And certainly the three and four and five hour cases are pretty much a thing of the past with a few exceptions. Our reward for our increased efficiency is decreased time and therefore decreased payment. Let's talk about Avastin briefly. We could actually talk about Avastin for a couple hours here, but you were involved uh, in that uh, history as well. Uh, it was an off-label drug, Congress, and Medicare had no infrastructure to cover off-label drugs, and yet it was the most popular anti-VEGF drug on the market, as we knew, enormous cost difference. Give me your, your historical uh, reflection on the Avastin story. So the Avastin story really begins at the ASRS in Montreal in 2005. At the same meeting, the initial data was presented for Lucentis, 
And at that time, we only had PDT and Macugen. And we saw the Lucentis data, and for the first time, we saw not a, a diminishment in visual loss, but we saw visual improvement. And when that data was first presented, there was a, an audible gasp in the audience. Oh, my God, we have a treatment that can make people better? The next paper, or maybe a few papers after that, then was Phil Rosenfeld. And Phil presented his preliminary experience with intravitreal Avastin and showed similar results. The difference was that we knew Lucentis wasn't going to be available for maybe a year, but Avastin would be available tomorrow. All we had to do was go back, find a pharmacy, make it up, and we could start treating patients as soon as we got home. And that's what retina docs do. So Phil's data literally changed treatment patterns overnight. And we all started using Avastin. The problem was there was no real mechanism to pay for it, either the drug or technically even the procedure. So that uh, resulted in some discussions with, again, leadership at Medicare. And what Medicare told us, the, the national Medicare folks said, this really isn't our problem. You have to convince the carrier medical directors because this is an off-label use, and we're not going to make a decision. We can't make a national coverage decision based on an off-label use. So we started talking to our contacts in the carrier medical uh, directors. And one of those was a gentleman by the name of Bill Mangold, who was kind of uh, the senior carrier medical director. In fact, he was the representative of all the carrier medical directors to the RUC. So we had a good relationship with Bill. And he would often come to us and ask us questions about different procedures, and we tried to be as honest with him as we could. Bill Rich and I went to Bill Mangold and said, Bill, here's the deal. We have a treatment that can keep people from going blind and make them better. We need to figure out how to pay for it. And because we had a relationship with Bill, and we explained to him that this could result in significant savings, he went out on a limb and said, okay, I trust you guys. We'll cover it. Once he covered it, then subsequently all the other carrier medical directors covered it because he had that gravitas. But again, that would not have happened without our personal relationship with Bill. And I'm, I am so proud of ophthalmology as a profession because I can, can't tell you the number of times I had discussions with carrier medical directors after Lucentis was approved and they still weren't covering Avastin. And I would say, you know, doctors want to use this. There are patients who can't afford Lucentis, don't have access to the copays, and they would say, now, wait a minute, you want, you want me to approve an off-label use and you're actually going to get paid less if we do this? And we said, yes, sir. There'd be a pause on the phone. He goes, let me run this by you again. You actually want to get paid less? He said, yes, sir. Uh, there have been several studies now that have estimated that the savings on Avastin to Medicare is in excess of $10 billion since those policies were instituted. History is so important to us as a field to be able to reflect on what others have done. And we always quote this uh, uh, famous saying by Isaac Newton that we stand on the shoulders of giants. And that is really true. And we do stand on your shoulders, George, and all that you've given to us, working with a great team of people, particularly on the socioeconomic uh, uh, challenges here. So on behalf of Ophthalmology, I want to thank you for that and all that you've done for us. It's a privilege standing on your shoulders as you've gotten us from point A to point B 
into still keeping a paycheck in our, uh, our back pocket. So thank you, George. It's been a privilege, Kirk, but again, health policy is a team sport. There's no one individual that has pulled all this off. As long as we keep focused on what's best for patients, we will continue to be successful.